Welcome to Movies We Like, part of the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. It indeed is Pete Wright. On today's episode, we have invited voiceover actor, queer activist, and snappy dresser J.P. Karliak to talk about Mike Nichols' The Birdcage, a movie he likes. Hey, J.P. How we doing? Glad to be Screw the birdcage, it's Morph. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my God, man. <laughs> I mean, it just, I just binged the whole, the, the whole uh, season of X-Men 97, and I am uh, starstruck, JP. What a great show. <laughs> well, thank you. Great. You're too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work doing voiceover. You've been doing it for quite a while now in a variety of, I mean, TV shows, movies, video games. I mean, it's it's been keeping you busy, and you've been doing a lot of really big characters. Morph, obviously, is is one of the most recent ones that you are doing on X Men ninety seven. But Boss Baby, you've been doing Boss Baby for a while. You're on um, Spidey and His Friends, the the Disney Junior show. I mean, a lot of voices all over the place. Uh, even doing like uh, some. I, was it Evangelion? You did one of the English voices for the translation yeah, of that, right? For the Netflix dub, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Genesis Evangelion. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, just the world of voiceover is a fascinating one. I mean, we do voices. We're, I mean, we do uh, podcasting, and so we're always using our voices. Uh, but it's a um, a very specific industry, and uh, but a lot of people, I think think that actors and voiceover actors are kind of one and the same. Um, when you went out to uh, to California, were you thinking, I want to do voiceover acting? Or were you saying, I want to act, and then you kind of fell into voiceover acting? How did you end up working in this industry? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I grew up loving cartoons. I was obsessed with the Looney Tunes. Uh, sure. And uh, Tiny Tunes and Batman the Animated Series and, you know, all sorts of, <laughs> basically everything Warner Brothers put out, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> and oh, how the uh, mighty have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, so yeah, but I, I, I think when I was coming of age, to the point where I, uh, my uh, my small mind started to understand. Oh, at one point I will need a job to pay for things. Uh, <laughs> sure, uh, is when I saw the movie Aladdin, and I said, Oh, okay, I really enjoy what's happening here. I would like to do that. Robin Williams is playing the genie. So clearly the voiceover thing can't be a real job, but he is an on-camera famous person. So clearly I must have to be an on-camera famous person. And then they will let me do the voiceover stuff. (laughs) Gotcha, gotcha. So that's kind of the the, 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 the mission (laughs) that I operated from for a number of years. I mean, into college, I think. Um, And uh, luckily, I had some professors who disabused me of the notion that I needed to be on camera famous to do voiceover. Um, but, you know, I, I went to school in L.A. I, uh, I was uh, pursuing the on camera career uh, for a while, but I started to dip my toe into voiceover. And over time, you know, when you're the struggling actor who has those limited pennies to put towards your career, I started to find myself getting more traction and enjoying voiceover more. And so more and more money was going in that direction and less and less was going towards on camera. And so finally a manager that I had said, do you even really want to do this? And I'm like, (laughs) no, I don't think I do. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So, um, but yeah, voiceover snowballed over time. You know, I I started, uh, I got my first agent in 2006. Um, And that first year, I think I had one job. Second year, I think I had two (laughs) Um, And then over time, it just sort of snowballed until it was about 2015, 2016 when I started doing it full time. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. The the credits are amazing and the long series credits, too. I mean, you you talk about things like, you know, the kids shows like the, the Oz stuff, of course. Uh, you know, you were on recently on another true story show with uh, Mandy Kaplan, Make Me a Nerd, talking about Castlevania. That's mm-hmm. a great show. And uh, uh, obviously you're a voice uh, there. But the game is dope, too. Uh, uh, games. I, I mean, the ga- it's funny. I was just I was just at a comic book store. I was talking about that that show yesterday because I, I have t- I have many memory, t- mem- uh, many uh, nerdy T-shirts. And one of them is my Castlevania shirt. And he was like, oh, my God, are you on that show, too? And I'm like, look, I actually begged my way onto that show because my ringtone is Castlevania. Like, I love 
the get the original game. I love the original game series. And when a friend of mine, uh, who is also the voice director on uh, on X Men, uh, mm -hmm. she was working on Castlevania, and I was like, "Look, I will burn a busload of nuns if you let me be <laughs> on this show." Um, the and things you have to do to work in LA for that show, yeah. right? <laughs> Entirely, they, it will happen in the new series. Um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm just some random ancillary voices getting eviscerated, screaming as my blood yeah. and my guts pour out, you know. Um, but I, that was that was everything. I was so yeah. to be a part of it. Oh, that's amazing. Fantastic. That's amazing. Do you so the the act of figuring out your uh, character range as a voice actor because you do. I mean, so many of the things you do are in a fantasy universe. What goes into what goes into tuning your <laughs> tuning your tool, uh, so to speak, uh, to right. figure out what you're what you're capable of? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, I tell people like you know wh when people are less, what was the most useful thing you learned in college? The funny thing is, is I one of the most useful classes I took actually was not an acting class at all. It was a general education science requirement, but it was in phonology. Uh, hmm. which was all about the vocal tract, how we make sound. Uh, it was actually taught by the guy. Okay, I don't know how many people on this are off book on the film version of My Fair Lady. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, uh, Rex Harrison, who is a, a, a very cunning linguist, uh, he, uh, uh, he has a phonograph that he's playing, Vitrola, with, that has a... a just a, it's a record that's just playing all these vocal sounds. The guy who taught my class was the guy doing those vocal sounds. <laughs> Holy cow, wow. Oh my God. That is the deepest of deep cuts. I that's know, right? 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 It's, so, it's so randomly obscure. Um, but yeah, so it was really just about learning, you know, uh, kind of thinking about my vocal tract as a musical instrument and where the buttons to press, like, the different things mm -hmm. to make different sounds and, like, dials to turn and all of sure, that. So yeah. that's really where I started to pick it up. Um, and also as a chronic code switcher, uh, you know, growing up as, as a queer kid who's uh, an adopted queer kid, I might add, who's always the people pleaser trying to, you know, sound yeah. in a way that is appealing mm. to people. I was always, you know, shifting my vocal uh, gymnastics um, <laughs> to hopefully fit in. Uh, yeah, so it, sure. it, it all kind of dovetailed together to uh, fit the skill set. I just I I know that if I uh, uh, if I ended up doing any sort of voice work like I have one I've got I've got one and it's not good uh, and every character that I would try to do would be a variant of that like how I can listen to your work and it just sounds like a different different person every time a different being every time it, it's it's beautiful thank you well and uh, you know I think there's an element of that also where it's something like you know the boss baby and that's there was you know a very famous actor Alec Baldwin who had portrayed him in the movies and then you're coming in to to do it on the show how does that affect what you're thinking about when you're bringing this character to life in this other format Yeah I mean uh... As you said, I've played a lot of legacy characters, and every one comes with its own set of requirements. Um, yeah. Especially, like when I did Wiley e. Coyote, uh, there wasn't. It was more of a, a feel alike than a sound alike, because mm -hmm. most people, when they think of Wiley e. Coyote, they just think of little signs saying "help." You know, uh, they don't <laughs> think of a voice necessarily. Yeah. So I had a lot more freedom than, say, a Bugs Bunny or a Daffy Duck. But Boss Baby was very specifically dead on the money. Um, hmm. They wanted an exact match. And partially because they weren't necessarily auditioning for a replacement. They were actually auditioning for somebody to just do the scratch because Alec was still deciding whether or not oh. he was going to do the show. Interesting. Wow. Um, and it wasn't until I think like we were four episodes in where they were like, oh, by the way, it's you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, but it was hard. I mean, those first, that for a whole first season of like 10 episodes was really difficult because we were spending so much time getting the cadence, really like hmm. drilling into the way Alec delivers the lines. And then I think partially because it started to just become second nature and I was just getting the hang of it. And also because as the series moved on, we started moving away a, li a little bit from his very specific delivery 
and making it more mine. Gotcha. Um, so it's still boss baby. It's just, you know, a slightly different interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's nice to have that creative freedom after a while, but you know, you always do want, you always want Mickey to sound like Mickey. So, um, right. Yeah. Interesting to listen to like your first episode as, as boss baby and the last, like, I, I haven't done this. Unrecognizable. You, is it really? Like, <laughs> no, I don't know. It, I have no, I, that's, that's actually very interesting. I, I haven't listened to them back to back. Yeah, I wonder like that that the act of taking ownership of a of a voice character as uh, like what a great case example of how that works. Uh, that yeah, that. and also the circumstances were so different because right. you know, we did two different series, each was uh multiple seasons. And the first series we recorded in person, often, you know, a group of us would record at the same time. I was very lucky to be able to record with the kid that played my older brother. Mm -hmm. um and so we got had that repartee but the whole second series was recorded during the pandemic so there was no interplay i yeah. didn't even meet most of the cast until well after so wow yeah i think you record go ahead andy sorry does that change your uh your approach or like how you feel uh, like when you're recording a session when you actually have more interplay with other actors yeah i mean i i have some background in improv so when you're recording with other actors, there is that yes and snappity snap, you know, yeah. like, you know, zip zap zap sort of stuff happening. <laughs> um, but uh, I think when I think when you're by yourself, it really is. I mean, sure, sometimes a dir the director will read in with you, you know, so you get a little bit of that. But often it it feels a little bit more like um, like just playing make believe as a kid. You're inventing every single thing in your head, including the person you're talking to, you know. Yeah. It, it's all up here. <laughs> Can you uh, just, uh, what are the practicals of doing the job today, right? You you mentioned you have a studio at your place. You're in LA. Mm -hmm. um, what? But uh, do, are you recording, you know, 90% of everything you do at home? Do you still go into a studio occasionally for, for these kinds of things? What What is the right job now like? It's, right now it's probably like 70%. It's actually moving back in person a little bit more. Okay. Uh, which is great, by and large. I will say, well, <laughs> we're recording this in the summer, so getting to record in person at an air-conditioned studio is fantastic. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> we love it. Um, That's right. But I will say, you know, if I have the if I have my druthers, uh, I live in Long Beach, so I'm a I'm a good couple minutes away from uh, Burbank, where a lot of this stuff is recorded. Um, if they're asking me to come into the studio to just talk to people over a Zoom, I'd rather just stay here, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, but if there's anybody, like, from production, or especially if there's anybody from the cast, even if it's just that our, our sessions are bumped up next to each other, oh, I'll go in just for yeah. that, because I'm a little bit of an extrovert. I really love that camaraderie and getting sure. the opportunity to have those chats. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's what makes it worth it. Well, and that, yeah, because I mean, in the world of acting in this capacity, it is mostly, it's all behind a microphone. You're not on set. And that's you know, something that's so nice about the film community is like you, you have this family that you've kind of created. And when you're, you know, in a microphone or in, in a booth behind a microphone, you're not necessarily getting that as much. So I can imagine that that's a very valuable um, aspect to, to uh, look at. Absolutely. Yeah. When... Um, do you, um, in TV, do you find that, I, I know in film you always hear, you know, people, you know, the the big actors and stuff, like, I always think of Tom Hanks on some talk show when he's talking about, like, and I can't remember what they call it, but just the voice foley that they do, like exertions or something that they, they call them, like all the, uh, oof, uh, like all the sound effects that you make as a voiceover actor. Um, do you find in TV you're, you're doing a lot of that still? Or because I know there's like in the world of production, like the TV is not, not quite as big or robust as, as what they're doing in film, but uh, do you still do quite a bit of that? Yeah. And I mean, it kind of depends on, on the project. Like, yeah. Um, let me think of some examples here. I imagine uh, the, Spi Sp the Spidey and Friends. Yeah. No, for Spidey, we don't do a lot. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah, you know, and most of it having to do with because it's a little kid show. Mm. Usually, the more exertions makes it feel more violent. In quotes, you mm -hmm. know. Um, <laughs> sure. And they want it to feel as like like we're playing catch 
just with a <laughs> pumpkin bomb. But you know, we're just we're playing catch. <laughs> you know, it's all it's all very muted. Boss Baby, we did a lot. I mean, rewatching that show sometimes, like that baby got dropped and shaken, and like I mean, there's so many crimes that happened to get that poor kid um, violently, violently thrown downstairs. Um, so there was a lot of efforts that we would do for that. Certainly for X Men. Um, and then, as I mentioned, for Castlevania, you know, uh, super violent. Yeah. And especially with shows that have a, uh, a celebrity cast, they might be doing their own efforts for sure. But as far as like, usually the workhorse voice actor will not only be doing our own efforts, but we'll also be doing the wall up for like the crowd scenes and, you know, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll mm-hmm. give us a few sure. things to do. Celebrities usually have the one thing to do. And then they bring in a loop group to kind of fill in the rest of the, uh, the soundtrack. So for that, yeah, I mean, super violent, like the viscerations and, you know, both <laughs> both the doing the stabbing and getting the stabs, you know. It's all right. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's a very fun part. And you just hear them like sometimes on special features, they'll have them just like you can hear them just making all those sounds. And it's just like, what a strange part of the job to just sit there and make all these sounds. We need some sounds like you're falling downstairs. Do that. L- give me some sounds for that, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, the video game <laughs> stuff is always the most fun is the like. Okay, so um, now you are getting hacked in half with the chainsaw. Um, <laughs> we want um, a short, medium, and long. And um, let's also do it at uh, the chainsaw is cutting through you quickly. It is going at half speed. Let's also have one where it gets stuck. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Do you know that that brings to mind? Like you, you know, we talk to actors, and sometimes you you, you get the, the there is a visceral response to the line reading from a director. I'm I'm curious in your space what it's like to work with and what the characteristics are of the best directors to help you get the most from this performance when you're missing so much of the other you know elements of the performance. I. So as somebody who's done a bit of directing myself, mm-hmm. um, what I've picked up from uh, other voice directors that I love, uh, one that I absolutely love, Keith Farley, who primarily directs video games. Um, Keith has a music background. So sometimes if he wants to get a particular cadence, he's like, I want a little less da 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 and more da 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 you know, like, it, so it's just like, it's not a line, reading, a triplet. but it's, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's yeah. an emulation of what he's after, you know, and I still, ha- there's still some room for creativity within that. Or when I do it, I will basically give the cadence that I want, but I'll use different words. So instead of get out of this house, it'll be like, you know, I'm like, you know, you're really trying to be like, I need you to leave. Mm-hmm. And I gotcha. just like, I want you to say, get out of this house exactly the way I said, I need you to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Subtle. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but it, but it does, it gives, it gives it just enough of the illusion that it's like, we're, we're collaborating on this. I'm not telling mm-hmm. you exactly how to do your job, but I am telling you what the requirements are of what we need. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and that, I mean, it just goes back to, I'm thinking about the 70% that you're doing in your home studio when you're not hanging out with a cast and not able to have the repartee with a, with a, another actor uh, in the booth. Uh, the, the act of figuring out how you can get in the head of a director who has the more complete picture of the final product is uh, that that is a veil for me. I, I have a hard time seeing through that, how that the magic comes together there. I mean, I think so much of it is just relying on them. I mean, mm-hmm. I've, uh, I've been very fortunate to work with Meredith uh, uh, multiple times Um on Castlevania, on uh, on X Men, on um, Sanjay and Craig from way back when on Nickelodeon, uh, <laughs> and I think s- uh, trusting somebody to that whatever you're giving them is what they need, and not and not trying to get into the head of production too much. Like, there's only so much that you have knowledge of. You know, yeah. if you read the, if they provided the whole script, yay. If you've read it, awesome. And now that's all you can really go from. And then everything else is just sort of, you know, their decision making. Um, and you hope that when you're doing three in a row of each line that one of them works. 
kind of not, they'll direct you. You know, it's it's really it's really a collaboration of trust because it it is also uh, intangible until suddenly. Right. I mean, uh, X Men for sure, especially because you know it was you know tiny little bits here and there that we were recording and. Um, not really seeing many visuals until the very end, just a little bit of ADR that I did. It wasn't until the premiere that I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> I had no idea what this was going to be. Like, yeah, really? In terms, of, in terms of, is it going to be great? Is it going to be, I knew, like, the scripts were good. I knew the scripts were good and solid. So I was like, all right, well, it's at least there. Hopefully, yeah. you know, it only goes up from there. And, but yeah. I don't, I don't think I was in any way prepared for, Wow, that's yeah, that's pretty insane. <laughs> well, and, amazing, and because yeah. of the popularity, specifically of the, to speaking to that show, like, do at, at what point do they come back to you and say, "Hey, we're going to do ninety eight? Have they said that? What are they doing next? <laughs> you oh, know, right. like, like are I mean, you? We're, doing, we're in the midst of season two. We're greenlit okay. for season three. So you know, and I, I think what's fortunate about animation because the lead time is so long. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I you know I do some uh, ancillary voices for on um, Grimsburg, a show on mm -hmm. Fox Animation Domination or whatever they call it now, and um, <laughs> and uh, I mean we were I was recording early episodes of the first season before you know when suddenly they greenlit season two, and partly because it's strong, it's a strong show, it's really fun, right. but also partially because. If they waited until it debuted and then they got ratings and then they, you know, hemmed and hawed about it a while, it might be two years sure, before a second yeah. season would debut. So they right. really have to, like, you know, backload it a little bit. Right. Yeah. 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 How often do you find you end up having to go back in to do more readings or is it a, is it a kind of a continued and planned process of like, you're going to come in and do some readings and we're going to get everybody to do that. We're going to start putting it together. And then we've got another session scheduled for you to come in and do some new readings of things that we realized, Oh, we didn't, that's not exactly how those readings were meant to go for the way that the scene's going to play. Like, do you find a lot of that? I mean, with TV, usually it's fairly, it's fairly systematic. Like yeah. with Spider-Man, I go in for an initial record. At some point later on, I'll probably be going in for another initial record, maybe six to eight months later, but they will tack on some ADR from that first uh, session. Gotcha. Like, oh, yeah. hey, we need to pick up a couple of these. Yeah. So it's, fa it's fairly linear. X-Men, because it was such a big swing, because there was a, like the storytelling yeah. was so heavy. I mean, we re-recorded re the first episode six times you know like wow. really? tweaky 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 um, yeah you know, just trying to get it right um and then film like right now i'm i'm doing the smurfs movie uh and that is so much more like all right we're kind of at this point in the animatic process let's get these lines so we can storyboard and maybe show some to the executives and you know and then you'll come back in three months later like okay we got some notes we're going to do a little bit more it's a little more i don't hmm. want to say haphazard but it doesn't feel quite as regimented it's more yeah. just like we need you when we need you and right you know plug in what we can from there right right when you're working on a film like smurfs do you find um like in that instance or and maybe it's just specific to that instance but are you a character or are you playing like where you have in some of your shows where you're like well i do this character but i'm also filling in some of these voices here and and uh doing a lot of walla like where do you land on that one uh, this one, I'm just playing a specific character. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And we, I guess we can't say who it is just yet, huh? Nope. Gotcha. <laughs> why, why are you smiling like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty excited about it. I know, <laughs> that's great. I will, I will say, like, you know, if, if you've seen the Deadline article, like... <laughs> I'm fourth build. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it's basically Rihanna, Nick Offerman, Natasha Leone, me. And it's like and you. <laughs> fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Weird, weird. So I get a little well, giddy about it every time we talk about it. No, yeah, as as well you should. That's amazing. But that's an interesting um, element, though, because there has been this shift in animation with celebrity voices coming in to do more and more. And uh, like, I don't want to say taking away the work from people who you were used to be doing, excuse me, doing all of the voiceover work. But there are a lot more celebrities doing uh, animation than there there used to be. 
Um, do you find from your perspective, like how has, how does it feel within the industry? Does it feel like there, that shift is, is working or do you feel like it's affecting what you're getting? Well, I, I mean, at least as far as films go, I mean, it's, it really is Robin Williams that kicked that off. Like, you know, yeah. uh, it, uh, thanks genie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do, you know, I think. I think there's some there's some really great value to it because first of all I think there's some fabulous performances I think Robin Williams I think you know uh, <laughs> there was a film I just did that had Aquafina in it she is born for this like Jack Black <laughs> they do they do incredible incredible work uh, Bradley yeah. Cooper as Rocket Raccoon I mean sure. who else yeah. like you know yeah. right amazing. right um, and also just from an employment standpoint when we have our union negotiations being able to threaten to take the celebrities off the table, it's a big leverage mm. point. So, yeah. you know, uh, if it was just all of us, no names, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, we get the job done. We are the workhorse people. But whether they would recognize that, ooh, who knows? Um, yeah. So practically, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's certainly a necessity to have them. But I will say the there has been a real lack of recognition of what workhorse actors do in terms of voiceover. Like, uh, the, ta like the, the talent that we have, the breadth of voices that we have at our disposal. And it's always funny to me when I walk into a room or I hear about friends who have you know, walked into rooms and displayed it, and there's that sort of jaw-dropped amazement of like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Drew Barrymore couldn't do that. It's like, well, you know. <laughs> Drew Barrymore has her things. <laughs> she yeah, does. Right. She <laughs> does. Let her have her things. She will always be my fire starter. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I think um, I, I think what's been really cool about this whole Smurfs experience is seeing. Uh, you know, a, a me, a workhorse voice actor, actually get an opportunity to play a large part in a film, which is yeah. Yeah. unheard of. I mean, Eric Bauza, who does the voice of almost every one of the Looney Tunes right now, um, has had that, like, in doing the latest um, Space mm -hmm. Jam. Sure, uh, yeah. But I struggle to think of other actors who have had the opportunity to walk the red carpet, as it were. So yeah. You know, it's, I mean, Peter Cullen, I suppose, that. might be one because his oh, voice yeah. was so iconic as Optimus Prime. It's like, who for else sure. are you going to bring in? Although I was a little surprised. I was like, well, of course, they have to put Hugo Weaving in for Megatron. I mean, it didn't right. quite carry the same weight as the Megatron from my youth, but still. I mean, look, I love Hugo <laughs> Weaving's performance, but it feels like any time they put him in a movie, it's like they're asking for him to just say afterwards, I hated doing that and I will never do it again. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All 100%. <right>. Thanks yeah, for playing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, because of Hugo Weaving being obstinate, uh, you know, Ross Marquand, who plays Professor X in our X-Men 97 series, was the Red Skull in uh, Endgame and Infinity mm. War. Yeah. Um, so every once in a while, we get these opportunities because somebody, Alec Baldwin, can't, you know, right. yeah. isn't, isn't free. Yeah, wow. that's awesome. I, uh, I I was I was going to drop D Bradley Baker in there. No, uh, he's so good. Oh my god! Oh my god! I mean, I, I'm a massive animated Star Wars fan. Like, yeah, and you know, and not because I was in it at the beginning. I was, you know, I was only in the last last season of Bad Batch. So, uh, yeah. you know, it, uh, I I was a fan because I was just a, honestly a fan. And yeah. For D. Bradley Baker to play, I mean, what must be thousands of individual clone troopers who are all clones from the same person, so they all <laughs> sound-ish the same, but for him to give each one their own personality so it never felt like, oh, it's just the same guy doing the voice. It's like, oh, no, right. they're actually just clones, and they all have their own lives and thoughts, and yeah, he he's amazing. Not to mention, he does the scariest grizzly bear sounds. Like he is a creature voice actor, and we did Looney Tunes together. And uh, he would play Squeaks, who was the little squirrel. 
but then he would also do like any random, you know, grizzly elk, elephant, whatever. <laughs> and like for him, to watch him literally with his hands manipulate his face to like get the get the right thing going to sound like a grizzly. Wow. Elk, horrifying, but amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. It's like, it's yeah. like the new Frank Welker or something. Oh, he's a genius. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any other favorites? I just, I got to call it one of my favorites from my youth. It was Lorenzo Music who did uh, Garfield, Garfield and... Mostly my, I, it was kind of tummy gummy from the gummy bears that I really kind of loved, <laughs> but like that voice that, that he had was just so iconic for me in my youth. Uh, but do you have any other favorites? He is the pinnacle of mirthful laziness. Like, yes, it, you know, <laughs> it, 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 he's like a warm, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, that voice was, I grew, I loved the Garfield series, the Garfield, yeah. is it Christmas or Thanksgiving? Gar, Garfield family Christmas. I mean, it breaks my heart every time I walk, I watch it. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. Uh, favorite voice actors growing up. I mean, I will say, uh, I Animaniacs was like my show. It spoke to me like this. This was the show made for you. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, Rob Paulson, Jess Harnell. Um, yeah. Um, they're amazing. They're absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, and and you know, and also at the same, well, probably within like a year of each other, Batman the animated series. I mean, Mark Hamill is just like he's. he's oh gone. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Who knew right, Mark speaking, Hamill? Yeah. Right. Like, right. Uh, uh, incredible. It's crazy. Like yeah. it's one of those. If you know, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it has been fantastic talking with you about your career, but let's shift our conversation and start talking about Mike Nichols' uh, The Birdcage. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a, it's a very fun film and a very uh, interesting, uh, well, and, and well-made remake of the original film, La Caja Fall. Um, mm-hmm. How did you come to this film? Did you see this one first before the original or, or what oh, was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My okay. mother took me to see this film. Okay. So I think I was. Standing mom. Oh. Great. In middle school? When I, no, high school. I was in high school when I went, went, and she was like, let's go to see this. Now, this is interesting because it's not like my mother was some hippy dippy that was like, I know my child is a homosexual, and so I need to take him to this awakening film. No. <laughs> she just thought it would be fun. Um, so I was having all sorts of epiphanies watching it, and she was just yeah. like, oh, isn't this delightful? So, yeah, um, yeah that, that was my first. I still have actually not watched beginning to end the original French film. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Um, and I think part of it is that, well, I've seen bits of it. And the funny yeah. thing is, is that, I mean, there are wholesale chunks of it that are just translated and lifted and dropped in. Yeah, so, absolutely. You right. Know, and I think, and there's also a little bit of physical abuse that happens in the original one that I'm just sort of like, I don't know if I need this. I don't yeah, know if I, yeah, I yeah. need, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, it's it's such an interesting genesis that it was it was a play and then a movie and then a musical and then this. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I uh, was wondering if you were having uh, all sorts of awakening thoughts watching this movie because of the subject matter or because it is a Hank Azaria vehicle of great renown and he is also such a transcendent voice actor. He is. He is incredible. Um, and I mean, I this is such a quotable movie, and I was probably and they're all his, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you no, know, I mean, I I loved Hank in it, uh, I, but I feel like every it was really everybody. I think, I mean, Nathan Lane really became my idol after watching this movie. I mean, I don't know if yeah. you could see, but like that's his headshot right in the show. Oh, oh yeah, that's all right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just I was just such a huge a huge fan of his his work. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's such a sparkly movie in that it, it's cartoony, but it's also very realistic, um, in its, uh, in its, in its relationships, um, and the heartwarming stuff that happens there. It's, um, it's wildly camp while also showing a queer experience, uh, especially in the early nineties in a very realistic way. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost a, it's almost a contradiction on multiple levels and yet it works. 
It's uh, and it's funny because uh, watching it again, I was reminded how annoying the kids are to me in this film. Like they're hateful. Yeah, they're they so are the bad. worst. They're actually there. That's one thing about the original version. I will say I liked the kids more in the original version oh, than okay. I like them here. Um, uh, but and and it's funny because. It makes it hard for me to watch because I'm like, oh, he's the worst. I can't believe he is asking his dads to do this thing. Like, it's the thing. It's awful. And I suppose that's part of the farce. We got to kind of get into that part of the story because it's really all about that last act where we get to see all of them interacting and how it's all going to play. But and then I was thinking about it a little and I'm like, you know, they're, the kids are young and kids aren't always like the most selfless people. You know, they're often, they have kind of these selfish things. And I mean, I know as a kid, I said some pretty selfish things and, and made some selfish requests of my parents that they were probably like, God, what a little jerk. I'm sure they <laughs> they thought yeah, that. No. But they're Endorsed. they're loving, they're trying to find a way to, to work with you on these things. And that was something that I, I feel so, I find so uh, touching about the way that uh, Robin Williams is trying to, or Armand, I should say, is trying to find a way to uh, to work with his son and find a way to uh, connect with him and help him still. And that's something I think um, I hadn't really thought about as much with this, but I think there is this level of that parental love that uh, that does reflect here. And the things that parents sometimes find they have to bend and, uh, you know, break within themselves in order to help their kids. For sure. I, it's funny. I was I rewatched it this time, you know, trying to pick up on some things that we would talk about, but also sort of with a, a conscious effort to be like, let me see if I can find why Val is sympathetic. Yeah. And thinking about it from an early 90s perspective, because there's even the mm-hmm. line in the movie. I don't remember it specifically, but it's it's way, in that early conversation between Armand and Val about like, I need you to do this. And Armand is basically like, I'm not going to be something I'm not. I would never do that. And Val's like, what about my third grade teacher? You said blah, 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 to cover. Yeah, right. And the multiple instances, I mean, yes, they grew up in Florida, in Palm Beach. So, you know, um, who knows exactly how many gay couples uh, were, you know, parents at the time that Val was going to school. But my guess is probably very few. And... If Val was the kid of the only gay couple and everything was about hiding, concealing, making excuses, there's a level of of trauma that comes with it and a level of normalization that Val had to do of like, my parents are this and they're weird, according to everybody else's standards. So I need to work extra hard to be normal. And he is so, he's not butch, but he's just so Ivy League. He's just so Mm -hmm. like classically like... (laughs) J.D. Vanchus, uh, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> saying the quiet part out loud with J.D. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you know, there's it's just and I feel like so much of that is in reaction, not in a, not in a you know, you can judge it one way or the other, but I think in a very human and understandable way of I'm not being they aren't being seen as normal at all. My parents mm-hmm. and I don't want to be seen as not normal. So how do I? How do I fix that? How do I adjust? And I think so. So it really made it understandable to ask this. And I think that Armand really in that, you know, smoky, you know, smoking in the bar moment is is coming to terms with like, wow, the, he may have had a harder childhood than I have originally thought. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, there. Uh, watching it this time, I, I, I think I, I watched it without the benefit before of having Young Sheldon exist in the world, and I've never watched a single episode of Young Sheldon. But I kind of imagined this time a young Val because uh, I, I wonder just how much. I, I, you already said it earlier about yourself. So just how much code switching Young Val had to do to figure out who he is in the world. And by the time he starts to discover and and cement an identity for himself, and that isn't the identity of his dad's, that conflict is legit in 1996. And so I find him, you know, the, the entire kid vibe watching it today kind of repulsive, but so relatable in 1996. Like, I just, I, I get figuring out how to come to terms with my deep love of my parents 
and my deep understanding that they are not, they don't fit in the cultural schema that I've adopted myself out of choice, right? Out of mm-hmm. agency. And right. I, I think this movie, it does, it does this so well, maintaining itself as a comedy and not lampooning the dads. Like they're funny because they're authentic characters. They're not jokes. Right, right. And I, th- you know, I, one could argue that Albert is kind of a pink facey caricature. And mm-hmm. from the perspective of when we were telling the story, yeah, I mean, like, we have Will and Grace's Jack because we have Albert. We, you know, we have we have Jesse Tyler Ferguson and what's his name, Eric Stone Street. Uh, Eric Stone Street, you know, yeah. You know, like the genesis is all there of of that yeah. of that heightened uh, like flighty flamboyant yeah. caricature. But I do think what makes Nathan's performance so brilliant is it always comes back to it's not it's not that he's playing a hysterical gay person he's playing a mother throughout the yes. whole film like yeah. even when he's yes. not in drag he's he's a mom and yeah yeah it really like to me it actually brings up elements of you know gender politics in terms of like what would how would albert identify now you know mm-hmm. 20 years of you know 25 years on from the movie um when we have language to describe gender Mm-hmm. in a way that, yeah. that we didn't have. Yeah, yeah, right, right, well, right. Well, and, and that's the, the piece, though, that, you know, you describe him as kind of a, a, a pink facey caricature, but Nathan Lane carries the scenes of heart and grief and sadness like nobody else. And, totally. and prior to this movie, let's say, these characters were not given such swings of gravitas to be able to, be, to become human and not okay. just, you know, no. exuberant facades. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the Hayes Code and that, sure. you know, queer people were not given the the benefit of being shown in positive lights. Right. And so they either had to be caricatures or they had to be villains. Thank you, Disney. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, but I do think it's that incremental, like, yes, Tu Wang Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, is three very well-known straight actors playing drag queens. Yeah. But it is the nuance that they brought to those performances that I think, while it, while the movie didn't do terribly well, it did open up the door enough of a crack that we could get the bird kit. Like it, it all, it all is just snowball yeah. developments yeah. that led one to the other. Oh, Priscilla, we also right, yeah, Queen Priscilla, of the Desert, right, right, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And we also have to remember this is the still this is the same year, nineteen ninety six, that we have The Rock with the uh, the terrible hairdresser joke, right? Uh, like the whole thing with the uh, the hairdresser when he. I, I, I mean, it's a I Michael can't remember Bay the scene, movie. But it's like, it's a know, Michael yeah. Bay movie, right? You're you getting some that. Gratuitous yeah. action with a dash of homophobia, Michael Bay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you seen Dicks the musical? Speaking of. Nathan Lane performance? No, we haven't watched it. My husband is a musical theater guy, and I, I, I always think that we're going to sit down and watch it at some point, but we haven't gotten to it. You should do that. Okay. All right. You should, <laughs> you should do that. I watched it with my daughter. It is, uh, in a word, unforgettable. <laughs> Great. Great. Worth it. All right. There's there's a level of this that uh, we're also looking at like uh, politics in the 90s because of course we have Gene Hackman and Diane Weist as the other side with their daughter Barbara mm-hmm. bringing up Bob Dole and they're going to go stay at Jeb Bush's place down in Florida like all of these things that really kind of connected it to the real world and uh, definitely I mean he's leading a conservative movement and everything there's this whole side of looking at all of that that I think is um, I, I think that. It was interesting because I was also looking like, you know, there, Elaine May wrote the script for this. And I think, I mean, she's just, you know, especially paired with Mike Nichols, the two of them. But um, there is this level of working to not necessarily uh, make total buffoons of those characters either. You know, Barbara also is likely, if she is... Uh, she seems to be okay with the idea that her fiance's uh, dads are gay. And so she's also kind of in a place where, where Val is, where she's like having to figure out how to tiptoe around her parents with these sorts of things. And so she's coming up with these crazy lies that now everybody kind of has to go along with and kind of ended up creating this whole situation. And so there's this whole level to that. But, but I, I, I really love the way that we end up 
watching Gene Hackman and Diane Weist <laughs> perform, especially once they end up at the dinner and like trying to figure out what's going on, how are they handling all of this, and uh, and just that that transition of being these ultra conservatives and concerned about the, their political careers, all the way to. One of my favorite shots is the moment when Gene Hackman turns around when he's on stage and he's in full drag and he's just got that look of like total loss. Like what, what, what has, what world have I just entered here? But it just plays so perfectly to watching that, that journey that he takes as a character to the point where they're getting married. We have the wedding at the end in the, during the credits. And I feel like that. Uh, is part of the story as well as watching these people learn that their kids are human and that they can be together. I, I, I think that that was also something that I took more away from the film this time. Oh, for sure. I, oh, so many things there. Um, what I find interesting about Barbara is that she's, she grew up in this privileged conservative little bubble who would, was seeing the liberal world outside and was seeing all the glitter and, and color and wanted to be a part of it, but she was never a, actually a part of it. So she goes to college, yeah. she gets this experience. Oh my God, my, my, my boyfriend has gay parents. How is <laughs> gay of me? You know, she thinks she's like, yeah, she's, she's like, she's getting to play with the, the bohemians, you know? <laughs> but she's, but deep down, she is still terrified of disappointing her father and being something other, like she's she's so scared to break out of the nest. And I think I think her journey and Val's journey by the end is rather beautiful in that they start to realize, wait a minute, we are dealing with real people here. And I, to your point about Gene, I, I think he and Diane do a beautiful job. And I I love so much about the big reveal at the end. Instead of of Gene Hackman saying, you know these these people are gay, we have to go, or like something disparaging about them. It's really more the recognition, like he says, I realize you both want to get married, but how many lives do you have to ruin to do it? And it's, he's not just acknowledging himself, he's acknowledging all the parents in the room. It's like, you've played a lie on, on all of us. Yeah. We've, all been, we've all been unknowingly brought into this space, and it's not fair to anyone here. And I think it's such an adult and mature recognition that cuts away a lot of the you know, conservative, you know, um, yeah. lampoonery that's happening. And it's re it makes him such a real person. And I also think the, the conversation between Gene Hackman and Diane Weist when they're by themselves while the whole family is in the bathroom trying to get the mm -hmm. bobby pins in the hair, <laughs> yeah, right. and, you know, and they're having that argument where it feels like Gene Hackman really buys into a lot of the rhetoric that he's that he's saying, like the whole Grover's Corners and, you know, and Mrs. Goldman is just, you know, a salt of the earth woman and like that he's for him, it's actually real, He like yeah. which is admirable in a way. It's like, no, you actually believe this. And yeah. for Diane, it's like, it's like, no, this is this is all the rhetoric that we're using to get to a certain place. You know, I, I yeah. just, like when she says, I don't know who you are anymore. It's like, yeah. I, I, I'm you're you're talking in ways of recognizing other people's humanity when it's really all about person been about personal gain. Yeah, like that Billy Graham's yeah. too liberal or whatever, like, you know, yeah. like and it, it's it's so interesting to see them have that counterpoint of like, I thought we were the team, you know, you think about like Bill and Hillary, like, you know, I thought we were the team <laughs> that were doing this together. And, and but we're both operating on totally different wavelengths here. <laughs> Right, yeah, and Which, the fact it, that it, she becomes more diabolical in that moment, right? Like, yeah, right. That that's a that's a turn. Yeah. Also, well, since Diane you mentioned the wedding, since you mentioned Bob Dole and the wedding at the end, I still <laughs> I have threatened for maybe twenty years that I'm going to get a T-shirt that says Bob Dole is gorgeous. But I <laughs> Andy, make a note. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Get in the merch store it's right away. It's campaign season. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's fu it's funny how how harmless it feels to say it and to like have a T-shirt right? that says it now when mm, you know there was yeah. a time I might be less inclined. Yeah, does, right, right, right. Does a movie like The Birdcage get made in twenty twenty four? Yes and no. I I think. I mean, I there's there's so many beautiful queer family stories that are being told but i do think that there is that they're more realistic there's less mm -hmm. there's less camp for better or for worse 
I love camp. So I actually, yeah. you know, in, enjoy that part of it. But I also recognize that we don't need to have that little yuckety yuckety aspect to make everybody in the audience feel comfortable anymore. We can just mm -hmm. tell an honest story. Right. Yeah. So that's a good part. Um, yeah, I, I feel if anything, I feel like the camp has shifted over to the queer kids. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of movies that, you know, whether it's that movie camp with um, Ben Platt or or no, that wasn't camp. theater camp, theater camp, theater, theater camp, camp, right? Or, yeah. or yeah. camp, or, you know, or Glee, you know, like yeah. it's 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 throwing the camp at the queer kids. But the adults are allow, are now serious enough that they can they're self-possessed that they can be themselves. Well, that also, I, I mean, it kind of speaks to the nature of farce these days. Like, how hard is it to 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 tell a story that's kind of farcical? It just seems like harder and harder to kind of like craft that type of comedy. And I think that there was maybe a more of a time and place for the, for the, for it with some of these, uh, or in the in decades past. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, what's interesting to me is I I think there would be uh, there is very. Uh, uh, there's a great deal of openness around telling authentic queer stories and a reticence to tell authentic conservative stories. And I, <laughs> if, if a movie like Twisters comes out and the director says on the record, we're absolutely not making this a movie that even mentions climate change, even though everything we're doing in this movie uh, indicates we're, we believe this is climate change, but we don't want it to become a conservative issues film, then a movie like this would not portray Gene Hackman and Diane Weist as, as authentically as I think they, they do here. I think that's the thing that's interesting to me, um, that the queer stories we've, we're figuring out quite nicely. <laughs> and I don't think yeah. we've figured out the, the, the stories of the right yet. Yeah, and especially in a way that is that humanizes. Yes. You know, yeah. That if we if we're able to find each other's humanity, then we're able to find common ground and thereby actually make movement and solve things. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Um, <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I I think I think you're right. I think there is there's a sense that if we're not sending them up ridiculously or demonizing them, which in a way is a flip of the Hayes Code. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That we're not doing our jobs, and yeah, you're right. I, I think I think to a degree that is unfair. While also, you know, I, I it is it's one of those really sticky things of like simultaneously we don't want to create buffoons out of people, and we want to show who, their humanity, while also at the same time recognizing that the conservative values of Gene Hackman's character, while damaging. You know, I don't want to underplay that there were those positions were damaging to so many lives. The conservative values that we deal with today are damaging on a whole other level. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. So right, it, right. It's, it's that weird, you know, we want to find each other's humanity, but we also don't want to underplay that, like, this is serious crap. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Well, even this film deals with the realities of some of these people who are creating these moral codes and running these positions in the government are the ones who are sleeping with underage uh, prostitutes, you know, and like that's that's mm -hmm. in this film. And like that is kind of one of these realities that they're playing with here. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, do you have any favorite moments in this film? I mean, there's a, there are so many lines and so many moments that stuck with me uh, as I revisited it. And it's just, it's kind of hard to pull them out because I just like feel like every 10 minutes you're getting like a handful of other just fantastic bits. But do you have anything that like is your absolute like go-to moments? I mean, the, the whole opening sequence is like the whole uh, dressing room fight is... Uh -huh. It's just brilliant. It, it it establishes what you're getting so well, and it never really lets up from there. It's it, yeah. you know, it just comes out like a like a cannon. Um, I think I really love because I laugh every single time, like really hard. Is during the dinner scene. Um, there's the scene where uh, Armand rushes into the kitchen. 
because he needs to get something else on the plates, you know, because they're going to discover the nude Grecian boys <laughs> in the bowls. <laughs> and they discover that Al- that um, Agador only made, uh, it's only one dish. It's just the yeah. soup. <laughs> and so they start screaming at each other. And like, and he grabs the pot and Robin Williams slips on the floor, <laughs> which was not supposed to happen. Oh, and like you know, and he gets up, and he's like, and he and Hank Azaria is trying to stifle his laughter, so he just starts crying. And Robin Williams is ad libbing, "Shut up, goddamn you! Shut up, goddamn you!" <laughs> it is the funniest thing because you like it, like I just watch it, it, like and um and Dan Futterman is just like, <laughs> like you know, just doing this ridiculous thing to try to stop himself from not cracking up, and just like everybody just goes full Looney Tunes, and it is. It's so organic, but so funny. Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, I I live for that. <laughs> what about you, Pete? So good. Well, you know, I, um, it's those kinds of scenes that I remember the, like the, the laughter in those scenes. But I think anytime, uh, you know, when you have Armand chasing after uh, Albert, to just remind them that that sequence that scene they have where he's just like remember why we're together like we love how much we love each other is that it, their relationship is is so real that you know the legacy for me of this movie is those sequences that that you know 1996 taught me as a young person a young man um how awesome and what a role model homosexual relationship can be as a heterosexual man. And it was, it's, it's just beautiful. And, um, in such a funny movie, that is such a gem of, uh, of, of, a of a relationship. Yeah. It's funny. The, the scene that stuck out for me, usually the scene, uh, the tender scene that sticks out for me is, you know, the one at the bus stop with the palimony Mm -hmm. agreement and all of that. Like it's a, and it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. But this time it really was when they're sitting in the kitchen and um and um Albert comes back from, you know, bag lady groceries, you know. <laughs> and uh Armand is sitting on an exercise bike at the at the breakfast table, like drinking yeah. coffee, like looking haggard. It's the family dynamic that's yeah. just so casual and lived in. And it actually reminded me of like of my grandparents, like my grandfather sitting in his like you know stained tank top, looking horrible, drinking coffee. My grandmother bustling about the kitchen, being ridiculous. Like it, it's so, <laughs> it, like you're saying, it's it's such an example. It's so human, yeah. and um, yeah, it's it it wasn't it wasn't the the waterwork scene that really got me. It was just the, right. the slice of life that got it. Yeah, yeah. There's that's so many a Mike honest... Nichols gift too, though, right? Like well, that's such a that that's a um, stock and trade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so many honest moments throughout the film, and so many funny moments. I always laugh uh, so much when Gene Hackman uh, when he goes off on the tangent about the trees and you know the purple mountains Black and just road. like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like, and everybody's just sitting there, especially the reactions afterward when Armand is just like, I was just so taken by what you were saying. Was that my wife who just called? Like, I couldn't even think. Like, it's so, that is just so funny. But I have to say, what just like right out of the gate, I mean, you talked about that initial conversation, but even before that, like as soon as we enter the club and we get the bustling and everything, just kind of setting things up for this world that we're in, there was one moment, and I, I may not have paid attention to it before, but... It's Armand, he's walking through, and he just opens the door to the kitchen for a moment. And he notices that the guy had dropped the plate and is picking stuff up off the floor and putting it back on the plate. And he just kind of like shakes his head and just goes off. I'm like, oh my God, that was just like such a fractional moment of world building, but it just gives so much life to the story. And I just like, from that moment on, I was smiling and laughing the whole thing. (laughs) I mean, what do you do? Yeah. There's a there, <laughs> I know, there it's like you're afraid of my heat. You're you're what does he say? You're afraid I'm my too primitive. Natural heat. Yeah. Yeah, to be on stage with your little estrogen Just rockets. <laughs> estrogen rockets. Yeah. Um, uh you're right. I'm afraid of your heat. <laughs> yeah. so good. Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah, there's there's a ton of just <laughs> incredible quotable lines. Yeah, yeah, delightful. yeah absolutely. It has uh, been such a del- delight talking with you about this film, JP. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about this, your career, all of this. We really appreciate it. 
thank you. This was just such a great conversation. You've already plugged Smurfs, uh, the the new animated film that everyone should be watching for when that comes out. Uh, what else do you have going on? And do you have any place? I, I mean, you you are. You, we said at the beginning you're a queer activist. What's uh, like queer box? Talk to us about some of the stuff that you're up to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm the founder of this nonprofit academy and community for LGBTQIA plus voice actors. It is called Queer Vox. Uh, Queervox.org. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're, an, as I said, an online community. We have an online talent directory for queer voice actors. We do networking workshops, classes, and we also do, um, consulting, uh, and workshops for industry to help them to better understand the importance of authentic and diverse casting and how to implement it. So it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. That's one thing we do. And then the other thing we do very timely is nerds vote. Nerds um, vote. Nerds Vote is an organization I started with my VO buddy, Courtney Taylor, and it's basically getting out the vote to um, gamers, con goers, cosplayers, comic book readers, and pop culture fans of all kinds, aka nerds. Um, <laughs> and you can find us at nerdsvote.com. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I didn't mean to cut it short as far as other projects uh, with these projects that you're doing, but I mean, other film projects, you got Smurfs, what else? Smurfs is Smurfs is the biggie on the horizon that I can talk about right now. Yeah. And yeah. only limited. Uh, as for, you know, season two of X-Men 97, it is coming when I have no idea. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, other than, oh, and um, I'm currently in... Um, I think it's almost uh, almost finished airing, but I've been uh, a new season of uh, the reboot of Fairly Odd Parents. Uh, Fairly Odd Parents Ooh, and nice. Wish. Uh, I play a villain in that, which is always fun. Uh, Dale Dimidome. So uh, yeah, mm. find me on Nickelodeon. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. We'll have links for everything in the show notes. Everybody, you can check that out. Uh, JP, once again, we certainly appreciate you joining us here today. For everyone else out there, we hope you like the show and certainly hope you like the movie like we do here on Movies We Like. Movies We Like is a part of the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network and the next real family of film podcasts. The music is Chonk Clap by Out of Flux. Find the show at truestory.fm and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads, and Letterboxd at The Next Reel. Learn about becoming a member at thenextreel.com slash membership. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we always appreciate it if you drop one in there for us. See you next time. Mm-hmm.